All right. Well, good morning, everybody, to uh, our uh, uh, Thursday's um, Research Horizon Seminars. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Cesare Morier Rogilla. Um, Cesare obtained her bachelor's uh, in agro uh, environmental sciences, majoring in uh, agronomy and global food security from uh, McGill in 2018. And during that time, uh, she focused on the uh, effects of organic and conventional uh, fertilizer sources on flower bud induction in day neutral strawberries, Fragaria by NNASA. And then in 2019, uh, she was a horticulture advisor with CARE International in Zambia, uh, where she worked with smallholder farmers to establish community gardens. Then uh, January 2020, uh, she joined Professor uh, Belly Gravel's uh, lab. Uh, to uh, pursue uh, her master's degree in uh, the evaluation of prediction models for uh, sclerotinia stem rot and soybeans um, under uh, the Quebec agroenvironmental conditions. So with that, I will give uh, Cesare the, the floor. And today she will be presenting her, uh, her project proposal for her master's. Thank you, Prokoyas Viegas. Um, everyone can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you for being here. And my project is going to be on the evaluation of prediction models for sclerotinium stem rot under um, the soybeans production in Quebec. So during my presentation, I'll go over what is sclerotinia stem rot and why it's a problem. And then I'll explain my plan to conduct the um, experiment and statistical analyses looking into modeling as a tool to inform disease control. So we've come to know quite a bit about Sclerotinia sclerotinium, which is a fungal pathogen that's responsible for Sclerotinia stem rot of soybeans, but also affects a very broad range of host species, more than 400 plants, and that includes some cultivated crops like in the legumes family, but also in the brassica families. And Sclerotinia, the genus, regroups species that produce sclerotia, as a survival structure. And when I say survival structure, this sclerotia can remain viable in the soil for very long periods of time, sometimes under pretty harsh conditions. So in terms of the sclerotinia uh, sclerotinium growth cycle, the sclerotia in the soil can uh, germinate in one of two ways, either mycelogenically, which produces hyphae, or carpogenically. And I'm gonna focus on carpogenic germination because for sclerotinia stem rot, it's the type of germination that's most important. So in the soil, the sclerotia are gonna germinate carpogenically, which produces apothecia. Those are little cup-shaped mushrooms. Then ascospores are gonna be released from the ascus of the apothecia and will land on the crop. There they're gonna germinate and the mycelium is gonna invade the green tissue. So it's gonna colonize the tissues of the plant. And by the end of the growing season, there's gonna be the formation of new sclerotia in the step. At harvest, when the combine goes through the field, those sclerotia are gonna be dispersed into the field. And in the next season, they can germinate and continuing the growth cycle. When uh, sclerotinia sclerotinium infects soybeans, what happens is the main stem rots and it kind of girdles and that blocks the flow of water, nutrients in the flow and xylem. So that um, reduces yields. Not only it reduces the number of soybean seeds, but it also reduces the quality and the weight of the seeds. And in Quebec, sclerotinia stem rot of soybean can cause yield losses between zero and 20% annually. But at the field specific level, outbreaks can get much more severe depending on the conditions. So let me quickly cover the conditions that lead to outbreaks of sclerotinia stem rot. And using the disease triangle, we can see that there are three main conditions required for an epidemic to arise. So one, we need a favorable environment. Two, we need a source of pathogenic inoculum. And three, we need a favorable, uh, susceptible, sorry, host crop. In terms of the environment, sclerotinia stem rot develops when temperatures are cool to moderate and when the humidity is high. However, at the field level, things can get more complicated because 
it's not just a matter of looking at the temperature and being like, oh, okay, it's over 25, there's probably no risk of disease. We might be wrong because we have to consider the effect of the canopy. So a closed or partially closed canopy is gonna create a microclimate. So underneath the leaves, it's gonna be more humid and it's gonna be shaded, so cooler. And that's perfect conditions for the uh, fungus. Now, the second condition I mentioned was the presence of a inoculum source. So specifically for sclerotinia stem rot, when the sclerotia germinate carpogenically, producing ascospores, that's when the inoculum source is present. And now the third condition is a susceptible host crop. Oh, and also something to mention is that sclerotinia sclerotinum is a necrophytic fungus, which means it uses dead tissues as a source of energy. So when the soybean crop is flowering, the dead petals are an excellent source of senescent tissues for the ascospores that are germinating. So the soybean crop is most vulnerable when it is flowering. Now, there are some strategies that producers can use to reduce the risk of disease, right? And most of the strategies, the goal is to prevent those three conditions from happening at the same time. So in terms of the environment, it would be good to increase the airflow at the soil surface. And we can do that by increasing the row spacing or reducing the plant population. In terms of the pathogen, we want to reduce the number of sclerotia in the field, the number of um, the amount of inoculum sources. So one way to do that is by incorporating non-host crop species into the soybean rotation. So for example, oats, um, corn, wheat, uh, barley is another one. And also oh, keeping up with weed management because some weed species are hosts, so they can uh, act as propagation ground and increase the sclerotia um, in the field. And then in terms of the soybean themselves, it's important to choose a cultivar that's partially resistant when the field has a known history of sclerotinia stem rot. And those are all strategies that are very important in terms of a good uh, integrated disease management plan. But you might notice that they're all things that we kind of decide to do before the season is even started. So during the growing season in conventional soybean production, producers will rely on the use of fungicides. So they're gonna apply chemical fungicides at R1 and R3 growth stages. So that corresponds to the flowering uh, stages of the soybean. And they're gonna do that preventatively. That can be a problem because if one of the conditions I mentioned is not met, those fungicide application might be inefficient or just totally unnecessary. And let's be honest, we know that using chemical pesticides comes at a cost, not only for monetary costs for the producers, but also an environmental one. So we've got to be more strategic, not only about whether fungicides are needed, but if they are, when is the best time to apply them? So the idea is to have a tool that can help us answer those questions. And those tools already exist, they're prediction models. The role of a model is to simplify a system. So it's a mathematical equation that's gonna include the variables that have the most impact on disease development. And specifically for sclerotinia stem rot, some models have already been developed. That includes in Canada and in the United States for crops like carrots, uh, the common bean, and soybeans. But there hasn't been a model developed specifically for the agronomic and environmental conditions that we have here in Quebec. Or none of those models have been validated for this context. So before we can advise farmers to use a prediction model as part of their integrated disease management plan, it's very important that we test whether they are reliable here or that we create a new model locally. So that's what I'll be doing for my master's degree. And through a series of analyses, I'm gonna validate some hypotheses. The first hypothesis I'm interested in is that the sclerot uh, sclerotinia stem rot prediction models that were developed for soybeans in the Northeast of the United States can accurately predict the risk of apothecia formation under Quebec's conditions. 
Then the second hypothesis would be that the apothecia during the soybean uh, flowering stage can be used to predict the level of disease incidence and the yield losses that we measure only at the end of the season. My third hypothesis is going to be that a narrow row spacing increases the risk of apothecia formation early in the growing season. And then finally, my last hypothesis is that prediction models that are based on temperature, relative humidity, and row spacing, so data collected in research and commercial fields here in Quebec, can accurately predict the risk of disease incidence. And directly related to those hypotheses, I've designed some objectives to drive the project. So the first one is going to be to go through the literature and take the published models and validate them for the conditions that we have here. Then I would like to identify the appropriate action thresholds to use with those models. The third objective is going to be to look at what's the relationship between the apothecia that we see during the growing season and the level of disease incidence at the end of the growing season. And also describe the relationship between the apothecia and the various agronomic and environmental variables that are specific to Quebec. And then my fourth objective will be to start to develop a model to predict sclerotinia stem rot in soybeans in Quebec. All that with the idea that a model could potentially be integrated into a disease, um, a decision support system for producers here. So to do all of that, there's going to be experimental sites. So 20 commercial sites uh, that are located across nine soybean producing regions in Quebec. And that's in collaboration with MAPAC and Serum. On top of that, there's going to be four research fields. So that's uh, here, Miguel at the Lodz, also at Serum, at Université Laval, and at IRDA. In terms of the experimental design, in the at the commercial sites, the field will be divided into four experimental plots. In each of those plots, we're going to take a sclerotia deposit that contains 14 sclerotia, and we're going to bury them in between two soybean rows. And the producers, they have different practices. So some of, the, uh, some of them are using like seven uh, inches row spacing, other 15 and 30. And some producers are using twin rows. So that's seven inch uh, row spacing in between two rows and then 22 in the next. In terms of the research field, it's going to be a little bit different because we have more control over the row spacing. So we're going to um, test three different row spacing, seven, 15 and 30 inches. And we're going to allocate an experimental plot randomly to each of those rows spacing and replicate it four times. That gives a total of 12 experimental plot at each uh, research location. And similarly to the commercial sites, we're going to bury a sclerotia deposit in between two soybean rows. In terms of the data collection, data was already collected in 2019 and we're wrapping up 2020 right now. And there's going to be another year next year, 2021. So we're interested in environmental variables. We're interested in temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and rainfall. And that's going to be continuously monitored throughout the growing season at each of the sites through a weather station uh, provided by AgroMeteo. In terms of the pathogen itself, twice a week we're going to go to the field and monitor whether there's apathesia formation in those deposits also to check whether there's any disease symptoms on the plants. And in terms of the uh, crop itself, we're going to note the growth stage, uh, the plant's height, and the rate of canopy closure, again, twice a week. Just uh, for a visual, in terms of the rating of the um, disease signs on the plant, how we're going to do it is we're going to take the ratings on 15 soybean plants in the two rows surrounding this corrosion deposit. So a total of 30 soybean plants. Also at R5, which is when the uh, seeds begin to form in the pods, and at R8, which is full maturity, we're going to go and take control um, data in control plots. So that's 15 soybean plants, again in two soybean rows, but where there's no sclerosia deposit. Now jumping into statistical analysis. So remember my first objective was to identify which of the models that already exist can be used to accurately predict the risk of disease here. So I'm going to do that with the receiver operating characteristic curve analysis, so the raw curve. And a raw graph can be obtained for each of the model by plotting sensitivity 
against one minus specificity for all possible threshold values of the model. And then to get um, an assessment of the predictive ability of that model, what I'll do is I'll derive the area underneath that curve, compare it through a test statistic with the line of no discrimination, the area underneath. So it's essentially testing whether the model predicts better than chance. And since I have multiple models, I'll be able to compare the area underneath the curve of each model to check which one has um, the highest accuracy, essentially. And that's through a Man Whitney U statistic. So after doing the rock analysis, I'll identify which of the models are the best for here. And then I can go into my second objective, which, which is to identify what's the appropriate action thresholds. When I say that, I mean at which predicted value should fungicide be used. So for the published models, usually authors have specified some thresholds that could be used. I would have to check whether they are appropriate for our conditions. And another way otherwise would be to identify my own optimal threshold. And that can be done through Uden's index. And again, going back to the rock curve, Uden's index is the point on the curve that maximizes both sensitivity and specificity for the model. After that, I'm going to look into first, what's the relationship between the apodicia that we see during the growing season and then the, the uh, disease incidence level at the end of the growing season? And I'll answer that question uh, with a correlation analysis. Then remember, I had three different row spacing at the research sites. So I'd like to know what's the effect of those row spacing on the apathesia formation. And to do that, I'll do an analysis of variance. And then I was also interested in the environmental variables. For the environmental variables, I'm gonna have to do a little bit of data preparation. So for every single day, I see some apathesia in the field. I'll go back and generate a mean, maximum, and minimum value for temperature, relative humidity, and wind speed. And then I'm gonna generate a moving average over different uh, durations. So going back 10, 20, 30, all the way to 60 days. And then um, for each day I see the apathesia in the field, I'll also accumulate uh, the sum of the rainfall until that point. And then my question at this point is gonna be, what's the moving average duration that's most strongly associated with the apathesia that I saw? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna identify that moving average duration through a correlation analysis again. Then my last objective is going to be to start the development of a model that can predict sclerotinia stem rod disease. And I say start because model development kind of requires a very large data set, which I might not have at the end of, it's a three, three year project. But looking at agronomic and environmental vi variable as independent variables, I'm going to try to predict the presence or absence of apathesia during the flowering stage of the um, uh, soybean crop. And so that's the dependent variable. And notice it's a binary variable. So I'll fit logistic regression models. One way to build the models would be through stepwise regression, where at the end, the models will have only statistically significant um, independent variables. Another way is purposeful regression. It's a little bit different in the sense that the first step is gonna be univariable analysis at a pretty high significance level. And that's to include the variables, the independent uh, variables that have a known biological importance into the model. So after this, um, those methods, I'm going to probably generate a couple different equations that have different sets of predictor variables, right, that include different independent variables. I'm going to want to identify which of them accurately represent the data so that have a high explan explanatory power but also which one of them are not too complicated to use that don't include too many independent variables. And to sort through that, I can use the AIC, which is short for Akaike's Information Criterion. So to summarize, the goal of my project is to optimize the chemical management of uh, sclerotinia stem rot in soybeans in Quebec. And I'll do that first by looking into the literature, trying out some models to see if they are uh, reliable here and then identifying the action threshold values that, are, um, that can be used for fungicide use. And all the while, really improving the understanding of outbreak dynamics under our conditions 
and trying to use that knowledge to model the effect of various agronomic and environmental variables onto uh, disease uh, incidents. All that to potentially have a model that we can integrate into a decision support system for producers. And I wouldn't be able to do that, obviously, without the support from my advisor, my committee members, everyone involved in the project, um, the staff at the LODs, my lab members, and also uh, the financial support. So thank you. Thank you, Cesare. Um, so at, at this point, uh, we can move into uh, questions. So if anybody has a question, you can um, unmute yourselves or type your question into the chat uh, and uh, ask us uh, are any questions we have about uh, about 10 minutes. Um, hi, uh, I have a question. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you again. Uh, okay, um, so you mentioned that you'll be uh, burying the sclerotia uh, between rows. So I was sort of just wondering, would there be a way to account for sclerotia that's already present in the soil? Um, and if you knew if um, the disease incidence was very high from a previous year, um, if you would know like where uh, you could go to sort of have those um, uh, row spacings placed. Uh, yeah, okay, so we've chosen to put sclerotia deposit so that mm -hmm. the scouting would be less intensive. Um, another way to do it without putting the sclerotia, uh, burying them where we know where they are, would be to kind of select a specific area in the field and do a scouting pattern in that uh, air specific determined area beforehand. Um, so for that, we would have to really know that each of the specific fields we've chosen have quite a, a an important amount of sclerotia already. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a question. Uh, so how far can uh, ascospores travel? Is there a chance for contamination of your controls? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a point of a bit contention in the literature so far from what I've understood. Um, there are some studies that have shown that ascospores can travel by wind in some, um, to some, some neighboring fields. So if I go back to, I don't know if I can go back to experimental design. So to simulate the Okay, to simulate the uh, conditions that we would have in a field, okay, let's say if I put my sclerotia deposit in between two rows, the wind could disperse the apothecia, um, the ascospore, sorry, further down uh, the row. So we would have maybe disease symptoms in a, in a larger area. So in terms of the control plot, they are further away from uh, those sclerotia deposit so that the, the risk wouldn't be as high. I think it could, it could be possible, but it wouldn't be um, as high, yeah. Um, Suha asks, how many sclerotia are you gonna bury? Uh, because it is known that the size of scleroric eternites, eternites, I don't, I don't know what the, how many apothecia develop? <laughs> and have you have you taken this into account? Oh, that's okay. So it is known that, that there's an the that uh, the the sclerotia eterna like they have an, um, uh, a a very long lifespan in the soil, and so how many are they going to the uh, pothecia going to develop? And so have you taken this into account when you bury your your sclerotia? Okay, so I've buried um, fourteen sclerotia per experimental plot. Now, in terms of the um, number of apothecia that is formed from each of the sclerotia. Um, okay, going back to here, let's say in the model, right? I'm treating apothecia as a binary variable. So either presence versus absence of it. So I'm to uh, determine whether a um, field has some apothecia or not, I have a threshold value. So 
it's not necessarily after one appetitia that I say, yes, it's present. I'm coding that as a one, right? So when I do my disease um, incidence correlation with appetitia presence, that's also kind of what I want to determine. After how much appetitia do I see? Can I say, okay, yes, that field had appetitia at that flowering stage? Um, so the question that's important to me is not necessarily if one a particular sclerotia is always produ let's say the size of the sclerotia is always producing the same number of apetitia, but whether after uh, seeing one apetitia, if I can count that as a presence or absence um, case, it's more at that point. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Um, I can't hear. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, well, uh, it's just saying the distance of various sclerosis are close to, are close to a few. So I mean, I, I had a question. Uh, um, so, so wide mold or uh, sclerotinia stem rod is, is an opportunistic um, pathogen. It's quite opportunistic. So it really, it depends on very specific conditions. It it's, as you said, it's necrotrophic. It requires that the infection starts on necrotic tissue, which is this often, you know, the uh, 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 senesced blooms that fall onto live tissue so that there's the whole process can get started there. And so there's in the, you know, we, when we consider the disease triangle, there's very, there's, I, let's just say there's, the, the conditions are more specific than in other uh, pathogens. So it's, and so this is, I think, in my opinion, because I've thought about this, uh, your specific topic as well for a while, is that um, people have struggled to predict uh, the development of disease. So how, and this is because of the specificity and conditions that it requires. Uh, oftentimes, that you, you, it it doesn't develop because of the because of the management or simply because of the uh, weather conditions that year. So, an effective prediction model would have to have some sort of validation stage where you where you feed it independent data and it and it and it predicts. And uh, which, and then you test its its ability to predict. So the basically the accuracy of predicting independently gathered data from say the following year based on training data from the previous two or three or four years that you're going to collect. So um, have you? Th but obviously you don't have. I don't know. I don't know how. What's the scope of 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 data that you're going to have to to do this validation? But what uh, have you? Th have you taken this into consideration at all? Yeah, it's an excellent point. So that's why the, the focus is really on the validation of the ones that were already developed, right? The models that were already um, yeah. published. So for the full data set, right, 2019, 2020, 2021, my validation analyses, I'm going to do only with the models that were already developed. And some of the models have been validated in other regions as well. Now for the development of a new one, that's why I'm saying kind of start the work, right? Lay the groundwork. Yeah. Um, I haven't included the, develop, uh, the validation of those models. Um, the way I could have done it, let's say if I had many, 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 uh, like a large data set, I could have taken 2019 and 2020 to develop the model mm -hmm. and then 2021 to validate the equations. But again, maybe the limitation at this point would be the size of the data set. And like you said, the environmental conditions are such a big part of it because just this, this growing season, we haven't seen that much um, throughout all uh, soybean producing region. It's been so hot and so dry. That I don't have that many apetitia um, presence to analyze. So it's such a good point. We, we saw a fair bit of white mold in, at Lodz, at, in, in dry beans, that is. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to go check that out. Yeah, yeah, we saw we collect we saw quite a yeah fair bit. Was we have uh, some white mold nurseries from uh, from a common uh, uh, a dry bean uh, collective dry bean breeding nursery from across North America. So yeah, we saw a fair bit. So you could yeah that um, you could use that as a reference. But uh, yeah, I think uh, dry beans are a bit more susceptible than uh, than soybeans. Is there um 
I remember uh, Jennifer Lynn talking about like the partial resistance in common beings, I guess. Is there a susceptibility um, rating scale yes, that I could kind of look at? Yeah, to... you can talk to Jennifer. She knows that very well. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I have a question. Uh, Valerio? Yes, go ahead. I, um, I'm sorry, I talked very fast. The question does not make any sense. Um, Cesare, um, the, the location of the buried deposit of the sclerotia in a row, how many of those of those buried in a row you have put? You have you have a schematic diagram where you put a certain um, amount of deposit per few. Um, Here? No. no, you said. Um, oh, I think you mean you mean this one? Yes. Okay. Yes. So how many per row you have put these deposits? Okay, so um, that's just kind of a close-up of the experimental plot. So that's just one per experimental plot. Um, and then if I zoom out, it's going to give me kind of that, let's say, bird's view. So this is going to be 8 meters by 6 meters, and my soybean, um, my scrocia, sorry, deposit would be somewhere here in the field yes. in between two um, soybean rows. And then there's going to be another one in let's say my 30 inch row spacing here. And so another one here, and then 12 meters or about 10 feet separating um, my second block. And then I'm gonna have another one. And in between there's like buffer zones. So all of that, all of that area is covered in soybeans. And then there's gonna be, so let's say four plus 12 plus four meters, um, separating my two sclerotia deposits. So the, the sclerotia, when they germinate into apothecia, of course, will be airborne due because of rain splashes and humidity. So if you are, so the symptoms I'm assuming uh, will be, the, the ascospores will be infecting those uh, plants that are very closest to the, where you have put the deposit. How would you then, uh, um, determine the the velocity or the distance of these ascospores uh, away farthest from the inoculation site? To do that, I would have to probably, um, okay, let's say if I had to do that, I would take a Petri dish with a medium and place it at different, let's say, points in my experimental plot. And then I would um, check to see if I have any apothecia that are landing there, and then, uh, sorry, ascospores that are landing then, there. That's how I would do it. But how do you apply it to the field? Mm -hmm. But right, um, I, that's just like hypothetical. I'm not doing that. I'm not, um, in this project, I'm not uh, looking into the distance of the ascospores. How, how long? Taking the symptoms are the, the, the symptoms of the plant those plants that are closest to where you have buried the sclerotia. This is what I'm assuming. So what about the, yes. the soybeans that are away from the, from the buried sclerotia? What will happen to them? Will they be infected? Well, uh, that's where I'm taking the control, right? Um, so in the same experimental plot, uh, sorry. In the same experimental plot, I have my control measures. So 30 soybean plants far away from the sclerotia deposit. It's, it's still in the same experimental plot. So I'll still have a 12 control kind of subplot into my experimental plot. So let's say if my uh, sclerotia deposit is somewhere here, my control are going to be here. Yeah. So, so if you place petri dishes, how are you going to know that you have uh, ascospores on there? Well, I would have to um, Germinate them. incubate them. Yeah. And yeah, that would be just top of my head what I would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but you'd have to confirm that they are in fact uh, white mold, but... but uh, yes, yeah. yeah. Like once the I see some, some or no fungal growth, if I do see some, then I would have to confirm that those were Scobitinia sclerosterum. Right, not just any spores that just landed on that specific petri dish. 
they do have these uh, volumetric spore samplers, the Burkard samplers. You can think about that, but that's Burkard samplers uh, for spore collection. And those would probably, they sample, would sample a broader area than just a Petri dish. Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, Esquispores don't emit that, as, uh, sorry, Apothecia don't emit that many Esquispores. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not like a rust where you have like and huge clouds covering. Believe me, they emit a lot. More okay, so enough for them to be sampled on a uh, on a petri dish. I don't know if if, if, this, if this if this spores is uh, if there are spore traps in the field. I don't know. They can. Do you have spore traps in the field? No, I don't. And just uh, let me. Yeah. So in terms of that project, right? I want to make sure that the. Whichever measure I'm using as the dependent variable is something that can be easily used. So there has been some models that were developed with um, some like spore catching. So there was one for um, canola, for example, in Saskatchewan, where they used uh, the level of infestation of petals. But by the time that the lab received those samples from the field, and that uh, those samples were, like you mentioned, um, confirmed Scarotinia scarotinia and then relay that information back to the farmers, well, the time to apply the fungicide might be missed. So there's, there's this aspect as well that it has, the model has to be accurate, yes, but it has to be useful. So kind of balancing those, those things, I think is important. I know it's a complicated uh, field project, but I congratulate you and to the organization and I, uh, with th those models, it would be wonderful. So thank you for this presentation. Well, thank you. And again, um, none of that would be possible without like the, the, there's a very big team just for the collection of the data in all of the, the sites, um, the agronomists from APAC and everyone involved in the project. Like it's a, it's a big team effort. So this is, as a student, this is not only doing your research, but it will help you to coordinate and cooperate with other people as an organizational uh, yeah. in the future. So it's a well-rounded uh, project. I agree. I think I'm very, very, um, like I'm very thankful to be involved in the project. And also um, just the fact that we were able to collect data uh, this summer, I think is just amazing. Uh, in March, I was a bit stressed whether or not I would have a project and really everyone kind of pulled through at the Lods, uh, Mark and Pargat have been helping me so much. So I think uh, we're, we're really uh, doing something cool here, I think. You're fortunate. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions from uh, the audience? I think you've had we've had quite a bit of interest in your uh, projects, is that right? Uh, so yeah, it's a very neat project. There's how people, you know, developing a, a prediction model for for Scrotinia would be an extremely useful tool uh, because it's it's a big problem here in the Northeast. Um, I was just saying, I was just thinking because one of the things that we do for other type of prediction and in, in, in braiding uh, that we're testing in my lab, but I think that might be useful for you is to look into it when you get to the model development stage. There are some um, there's some machine learning tools that may help you in uh, parameter selection uh, that are um, there. Well, they're they're a bit they're a bit more. They're based on the same principle of what you've outlined there, but they're a little bit, uh, let's just say, smarter in the uh, in how they utilize how they utilize reward functions for the selection of parameters. So that might help you in the development of model, just as a model test. In the once you get to the model testing phase uh, later on, mm -hmm. uh, we we're doing that for, uh, and we have a small project in uh, testing genomic selection models mm -hmm. in dry bean and. Uh, um, they do have some. They do show some efficiency when you compare them to uh, traditional, uh, you know, forward or backward selection model, whatever any of these types of uh, of methods. Definitely, I'll take note. I will definitely ask around. Cool. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, if we don't have any more questions, uh, I'll uh, thank uh, Cesare for uh, your. Um, 
for your uh, presentation and uh, we hope to see you. Don't forget to go on my courses and fill out the survey, provide any feedback uh, uh, for Cesare and let me know if that is working. It should, I hope it's working. I tested it uh, before we got on here. Um, for some reason, our I tested the YouTube link before um, creating uh, this uh, before creating opening this room and it worked uh, but when everybody joined it disappeared so what I'll be doing is I'll be post processing this the recording and then uploading it to the YouTube channel the the plant science YouTube channel and then anybody external can watch it unfortunately those people won't be able to ask uh, live questions but they can always they can always email you the questions uh, okay um, Thank you, uh, thank, uh, thanks very much, and I will see you next week. Good job, everybody. Good job. Thank you.